Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, for those of you I have not had a chance to meet yet, I'm Ritu Agarwal. I'm one of the uh, co-organizers of this conference and I'm also the co-director of the Center for Health Information and Decision Systems uh, with my colleague uh, Gordon Ga, who you just met. Uh, it is my pleasure today to introduce our industry keynote. Uh, Dr. Glenn Tobin is the Chief Executive Officer of Crimson, which is an advisory board company. In this role, he leads the Crimson organization on its mission to be the national leader in supporting hospitals and health systems, in driving cost, uh, care, quality outcomes, improvements through physician-focused analytics, technology, and services. So he works exactly in the space in which this conference is all about. Uh, prior to joining Crimson, he's held a number of very important positions across many different organizations. In fact, the entire healthcare ecosystem. Uh, he was the chief operating officer of Cerner Corporation, who we all know and love as one of the biggest electronic health record providers. Uh, he was also the chief operating officer of CodeWrite, uh, which is a computer-assisted coding company. And early in his career, he was with McKinsey in a consulting role as part of their global healthcare practice. Uh, Dr. Tobin has a degree from Harvard University, a PhD. Yes. So please join me in wel welcoming Dr. Tobin. Looking forward to his remarks. Um, thank you very much for the uh, kind of for the kind introduction. It's great to be here. Um, when I was thinking on the way over here, I was remembering back to when I was doing my, uh, when I was doing my PhD, um, and I thought about a couple things I learned there. Um, I think the, probably the most important as a PhD student was to um, leverage available and existing technology. Um, and for me, that meant, I think I was probably the first person in my program to actually use word processing software to generate my dissertation. And um, I am 100% certain I would not have finished had I been left alone with a typewriter to actually to, to crank that whole thing out. Um, and the other thing I learned, I think, is probably maybe a little bit more relevant to this uh, to this audience today, is that um, you know it's really difficult to find a um, a great question on a worthy topic, and it's even more difficult to then have a unique source of data to try to figure out the answers to it. Um, and um, I think, uh, you know, in my career, I think I've, I feel really lucky to have had a chance to actually work on, uh, for the majority of my professional life, kind of what I consider to be a very, very worthy question, which is how do you actually drive change in healthcare using IT in a way that is possible to use it? Um, and, um, you know, I think this, this uh, uh, conference is addressing, you know, kind of exactly what you know, kind of I've spent my entire life trying to actually accomplish. And I hope that as you're, um, you know, kind of listening today, rather than thinking about me as someone who just uh, takes a really, really long time to get anything done, I hope you'll think about it as this is a, uh, a worthy problem in all of its dimensions, meaning it's really hard, it's really tangled to try to sort out. Um, and the good news is I think we're at the, you know, the very beginning. Um, of what can be, you know, a really fantastic uh, next five to ten years. So um, the other thing I realized when I was coming over this morning is that I had butterflies in my stomach, and I usually don't actually get very nervous uh, anymore when I speak in front of a group of people. And I think it's because I transported myself in the car as I was coming over to some of the uh, seminars that I did as a as a graduate student with you know a group of faculty members talking about my uh, impending uh, research. And I think the first few of those conversations didn't go very well, so I was imagining that uh, hopefully this won't be, you know, something that was, uh, that, that will be similar to that. Um, so let me just give a little bit about, a little bit of my background and, um, you know, kind of going a little bit beyond what, what uh, Ritu had to say. Um, so I started working on this question in 1994 um, and trying to use information to try to drive healthcare. At the time, I was actually very optimistic that we were on the verge of a, you know, a massive breakthrough and how things would, how things would happen. Um, I got involved in the EMR industry at Cerner before there was an EMR industry. Um, uh, and it was a very small place and, you know, we were just trying to figure out how this whole thing could play out. And um, 
you know, again, I believe that there was very uh, beneficial change was just around the corner as well. Um, when I got to the NLP company that was focused on coding, and what was really a focus on understanding the free text aspect of what's in the medical records, um, I was a little bit more seasoned, and I had a strong belief that the structured data that is kind of the dominant paradigm and methodology associated with EMRs was actually part of the problem. And so trying to figure out how do you actually use the text and the, the, the narration, which is so important in healthcare in terms of trying to understand what's really going on, how do you use that in a, in a productive way? Um, um, and again, I feel like I'm, I still may be a little bit crazy, but you know, 20 years uh, later, my current role at Crimson, I actually am now certain that change is just around the corner and that we're gonna be able to use, start using information in a much more intelligent way in the very near future. Um, uh, so, you know, and my, my wish I think for all of you is as you're delving into this worthy topic that you all find angles on this to actually drive meaningful change that will probably take a very long, a very long uh, period of time. So let me tell you just a little bit about Crimson. I'm just, I'm just gonna go here just to show you kind of just in terms of what, what we do to provide some background and context for the, rest of my, uh, for the rest of my presentation. So what we try to do is we're actually trying to use data that's available to actually create insight to drive meaningful change in certain you know, aspects of the healthcare delivery system. So we don't do much on the payer side, we do very little on the pharmaceutical side, but really trying to think about how do you help the providers of healthcare actually do something different. Um, we're not an EMR company, but we are, uh, thankfully, there is electronic information now, whereas there wasn't 20 years ago. So, so we try to access every piece of information that we can, but not just from EMRs, but also from other data sources, as one of the speakers you know, mentioned before, consumer data, uh, marketplace data, all kinds of things to try to figure out how to solve certain types of problems. Um, and we're working, the, the interesting thing here is that we're working literally with thousands of organizations trying to create lightweight analytic applications that they can use to go drive change. Um, and, um, you know, we're, uh, and again, it's all in the focus of driving costs down, quality up, uh, access to be better, um, patient satis the satisfaction of the human beings, who we used to call patients, but the satisfaction of the human beings to drive that um, way up. And um, because we see a lot, we're pretty confident that we're working on three pretty important problems, if you just think about it. Um, and just very, very quickly, you know, how do you actually grow in an appropriate fashion in this new world? Um, uh, how do you, the second one is how do you actually uh, change the practice of physicians so that we literally reduce the variation in care in a way that we've been talking about now for you know, 15 to 20 years. But what is, what's the mechanism you use to take data and enable physicians to improve themselves working with their institutions? And then third is how do you think about assuming total cost and quality? How do you assume uh, taking risk on the, on the, on the provider world? Um, and um, you know, kind of shifting some of that risk from the, from the payer universe, which has not been very well managed historically in terms of an effective outcome to, to improve cost quality. But how do you actually do that from within the provider universe? Um, and everything we're doing is really in light of um, you know, kind of all the industry changes that are going on in healthcare. But just in case I go on too long on any one page, I want to make sure I got my overall kind of point of view uh, you know, because some of the overall points of view that I think are the most interesting to us, at least, um, out there. And, you know, I think if you look at the last 15 years in healthcare, the interesting thing is there has, in healthcare IT, there's been a dominant strategy which has been implement EHRs. And we're actually a long way through that. And I think we can all point at ways that that hasn't worked, it's not quite done yet. But from a strategic perspective, the question has been answered regarding will healthcare organizations be using electronic information on a going forward basis? Um, and we're at a, this, you know, really in the moment we're at right now is very different than it was three years ago where we were still in the middle of this, just like, how do we get these things in? And now we're actually kind of in a different era, which is, a, which is how do we get value out of them? And that's the terrible problem that we're trying to struggle with today as an industry is it's just really hard to figure out how the EHRs are creating value for organizations. And so as we think about this, you know, kind of this post-EH era, the, the core that we're trying to, that, that we think is important and that, you know, I think hopefully will resonate with, with you all in the room is, how do you actually kind of drive behavior change at scale? And it's the at scale part that the IT now allows us to do, 
Whereas before you could do kind of small pilots, you could do uh, a variety of things uh, kind of locally. Now the opportunity is to do things at scale. And we are far, far from being able to do it. But again, I think the next five years offers really tremendously unique opportunities to do so. Um, and the magnitude of change that we can now drive because of where we are, I think, is, is uh, really kind of extraordinary. Um, all this is in, you know, in light of what's happening in the industry. And you all know this as well as I do. Um, you know, kind of, I'll just run through this very, very quickly. But you know, margin management, which really means prices are too high. The trend line is, too, is, is going up too fast. And nobody is going to pay the, you know, at this rate going forward. CMS has established very clear pathways forward that they are reducing reimbursement for hospitals in some of the latest uh, legislation and um, regulations that they've put out. Um, private, ex uh, you know, kind of private sector employers are trying to do the same thing. It's just unsustainable. Um, and you know, from a provider perspective, this turns into a question of margin management. How do I avoid going out of business? Then going up. You know, the population health management is really the dominant theory of the case, shifting risk onto providers. They'll be able to manage the cost better than the, the previous paradigm, and we'll be able to really kind of start to drive some change. Um, still an unproven hypothesis overall, but, you know, there's some interesting possibilities there. Um, that's then combined with number one, which is the creation of the retail market, which is being driven both by the public and private exchanges, but also by, you know, employers who are systematically and consistently driving up the amount of risk that individuals pay. And so the amount of uh, kind of um, uh, cost, the, the amount of transparency or interest that people have in terms of the economics associated with their health care is going way up. And I think you can see that in a ton of different data at this stage as well. And then finally, you know, kind of on the, you know, kind of a little bit exogenous to all of this, but we are all changing our view of how we deal with large um, paternalistic uh, opaque, uh, unfriendly organizations. We are just not okay with it anymore. I mean, you know, most people are. And this is also driving a fundamental relook in terms of how healthcare executives, the, the hospitals and physician side, think about how they have to position themselves. And the, the retail revolution that's being brought about by CVS or by, and by Walmart and by, you know, other types of uh, organizations is very, very profound in the healthcare system today. And uh, folks who are thoughtful are very scared that um, you know the profitable parts of their business is being is going to is being consistently chopped off. So none of this is anything about IT, of course, but it does, I think, set this context for why there's something meaningful that can happen today. And it's really about pressure being brought to bear on the system in a different way, particularly if, as long as the changes in payment reform keep going, I think IT actually becomes a, a much more interesting part of the future of how this whole whole thing works. Um, you know, it's still just beyond our grasp. I kind of created this red line uh, uh, on the vertical is value from technology change on the horizontal is time. Um, you know, when I first started getting involved in this, IT cost in healthcare, healthcare providers was something related to, um, you know, kind of in terms of the magnitude of spending is we were just below the metals and mining industry in terms of how much money on IT healthcare spent. Um, so it was really just a, a cost to be minimized and it was primarily based around revenue maximization and revenue management in the early days. Um, enter um, EMRs, you know, kind of leading up to this second dot on the page and, um, uh, you know, kind of there was a big hope that if you take the paper out of healthcare, everything will start to get better. It turns out it was necessary, not sufficient in terms of making real change. And um, any organization that you follow today, what you see is that the, this kind of promise of IT-driven ROI is still very, very elusive. Um, it's, a, it's interesting, though, to, to, you know, when you link the rollout of the EHRs to the economic side of things, um, the public funding of the EHR rollout was, has been absolutely crucial. We started working on that in the year 2000, I think, in terms of trying to build the policy foundation for public funding of our industry. Um, I went to work, I went and kind of, uh, kind of organized some stuff with the RAND Corporation in uh, 2000, 2001 to try to get an assessment of how do you think about, you know, kind of externalities, uh, basically, um, uh, you know, public goods argument, more or less. Um, 
And we funded a small research study. They kind of did some, you know, kind of proved the feasibility that this could be determined. That then led to a much broader and collaborative of a series of organizations that funded the Big Rand study that ended up being the kind of one of the primary justifications for the, um, for the expansion of the IT spending in the stimulus bill in uh, 2008. Um, and whether it's right or not, that public funding argument um, De developed in a de the decade before any real decisions were made, um, but it wasn't quite detailed enough. It didn't quite get to the right level of, uh, of, of, of understanding. Um, so I think where we are now is we're kind of, there's an there's a incredible, incredible skyrocketing of the amount of data that's available. And any organization out there that's you know, providing care, it's, it's unbelievable how much stuff is available. Whether you can get it, whether you can do anything with it, whether you can generate insight from it is a totally different question. So we're kind of on this very, very steep opportunity part of the curve where if we can figure out how to use that data, we are going to be able to make really big change. And it's all, uh, you know, kind of fortunately or unfortunately in this kind of the information technology to drive population health, there is a new set of questions that the EHR fabric that we've built it's just not really very well uh, set up to, to address. Um, I give one you know, simple example here. Um, in a population health-based world, there is a tremendous um, change in how people think about the physician network. Who's in it, who's not, how do you manage costs within the network, what happens when people leave. This is very, very different than what, hap than, than, than what has happened before. But what you find um, is that there is a, um, it's not all within, within one institution. So EMRs are fundamentally built on a concept of all healthcare is provided within an institution. But with clinical integration and the legal requirements that people have in terms of trying to manage care on a going forward basis, the population health aspect of what's happening is largely not within the bounds of one, you know, one set of organizations anymore. So the EMR fabric that we've built is actually a little bit inappropriate for this next set of challenges that we're facing. And so new ways of going about the problems is really what I think is the interesting part of the next phase of the evolution of the healthcare industry. Um, uh, and also please notice that because this is an event sponsored by a business school, um, I did put a return on investment uh, calculation. It's not very precise, but the return is red and the investment is green. We have spent a lot of money on this. Um, so it, it was, I think you told me I had to have something that was business school related in this, in this presentation. So why? I mean, I think this is, this is a, you know, kind of why is it that we're not able to drive the value in addition to the fact that, you know, the problem, the fundamental problem set has changed from the assumptions that this EHR fabric was built upon. And I think, you know, this is an example I came across the other day of a member of an organization that we work with. It's a very large organization. They've been implemented on leading EHR for a decade. Um, they're a development partner of one of the leading EHR companies. And as we're working with them to try to figure out how do they get value out of this, um, they have 3,000 reports that they can pull down in a library through, the EH, through their EMR um, that, are in, that are in the library. 300 of those reports are usable in any way, shape, in, in the least, you know, kind of at all. Not very much, but they are usable. And it turns out that there are 10 fundamental analyses and reports that are being generated that are driving the future of, you know, kind of the, the, the decisions within this organization. And every one of them is generated by an, by an analyst on a, an, ex, an access database. Um, and there's kind of a line outside this poor analyst door every morning to try to come and to try to get the report. And you see this consistently in the healthcare industry today is that there, there are these healthcare IT analysts that are just at the very center of what it means uh, to be able to generate useful information out of, uh, out of this vast and expensive electronic infrastructure that we've created. Um, turns out that you know, it's harder than it looks to generate actionable insight. Um, and I wanted to turn to why I think it's you know, what it is about that actionable insight um, that's important. And I'm going to, I want to make sure I leave enough time for questions here. So I'm going to skip a piece here, which is why I think the EHR infrastructure is, is not really designed to do what we need to do now. Um, 
uh, but I do want to just mention a couple things on this is that, you know, the cost of breaking, part of, the, part of what we're trying to accomplish, I think, as a, as a society, is we're trying to allow um, data to be much, much, much cheaper to be able to access in a productive and practical way. And by re reducing the burden of accessing and getting your hands on data and being able to then make it comparable in some way, you actually create the opportunity for innovation to occur in terms of new data being tied together in new ways, uh, in terms of people being able to create their own unique way to think about a user interface, for example. And right now that's not happening because the cost of entry into this industry from an IT startup perspective, of which I had the privilege of leading one for a while, is utterly incredible in terms of how hard it is to break into this world that we have created. And in some ways we've, um, you know, kind of uh, grandfathered a set of organizations to be local monopoly providers in terms of the, the IT infrastructure for healthcare organizations. Um, and so I think one of, the, one of the questions that I've got that I would love it if the policy and the research community would address uh, is what would it take to practically reduce the cost of interconnection of data so that you can do something with it by an order of magnitude, by two orders of magnitude? If we did that, the entire nature of what's happening in the healthcare ecosystem around technology would be dramatically different. Um, the nascent efforts around the FIRE initiative are fantastic. It's the first real breakthrough that we've seen in terms of the, trying to really solve this interconnectivity problem, the cost of interconnectivity. But is it enough? Does it consider all the, all the relevant use cases? And what are the other impediments to actually connecting systems in healthcare such that from a practical perspective, from the perspective of an innovator or an entrepreneur, you can actually have a great idea, do great analysis, and have an option to actually create a business that would support this. Um, who's doing this research? And if, you know, I could ask, if I had any hope for my, you know, kind of my time here today is that a couple of research questions may, you know, kind of trigger for people and we can get a more thorough and interesting look at them than we've had historically. Um, but obviously reducing the cost of interconnectivity is necessary but not sufficient to enable this massive change that we're trying to see in healthcare. Um, and here, you know, one of the things that's fa been fascinating to me over the years, and I don't know to what extent um, folks have looked at this or thought about it, but I, I kind of call it the problem of the pilot. So you can go back 30 years in the literature to what was being put out at the Regan Street Institute or what was being done as, you know, looking at what was happening within the, the Veterans Administration. And you can find great research in terms of what it takes to actually change practice, reduce variation in care, drive better cost and quality outcomes. Um, and the pace at which these types of articles and findings are being published has only increased from there. And yet, we can't scale anything such that it has system-wide impact. It's too hard, it's too slow, and it's just not happening. That's the core problem that we're trying to solve. So, as I'm, I, I'm not being critical, except of us, because it's, it's really hard and we haven't been able to figure it out yet. Um, and um, why is that? Like, really, why have we seen so few examples of very interesting innovation move beyond the pilot phase or the one institution phase and move into some, sort, some form of a rollout across, across this industry. I don't understand it. Um, we have thousands of case studies that we generate as our organization. It's, we we incent our teams that work with our members to find the ROI on our, on, our, um, on, our, on, our, on our systems. We have thousands. And yet, I'll bet if I looked at the thousand, I'll bet 900 of them haven't been replicated very far. It's enormously difficult. I think part of why this is true um, is the following, which I'm guessing you can't see, but I thought I would just read a little bit of. And this is kind of, it's, it's really hard to actually get to something that's actionable. So here we've got a typical scenario. Um, uh, 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 on the left-hand side, administrator saying, hey, are we using all of our OR capacity? It goes to the analyst. And the analyst sends back a report and says, here's the number of reports we do by month. And then the, the administrator says, yeah, but is this volume good? Can we add a denominator to reflect capacity? I mean, isn't that important? 
and the analyst sends back, uh, you know, here's the average utilization using national benchmarks of what things should take. And then, but the administrator then says, hey, what about, shouldn't we, shouldn't we adjust for kind of service line mix? And the analyst says, okay, fine, I can do that too. I can, uh, you know, kind of, I can adjust for the service line mix and here's, you know, OR three and four look like they're not being utilized very well. Um, and then the administrator is saying, but, but who's got the block time, who's got time blocked in OR three and four? Why is that a problem? Um, and you can see this just going back and forth and back and forth in this iterative nature of generating insight in healthcare today means that things happen very, very slowly and the level of investment for each organization to generate enough insight to really change their behavior is, incre is massive because this process just keeps going on and on. As soon as you get the doctors involved, there's a different set of questions. Yeah, but you don't understand um, the, uh, uh, you know, kind of the, the staff in this OR is better than the other staff. They get things ready faster, so I don't have any control over exactly how fast I do things. You know, you just see this, this constant evolution, devolution into further and further details. And as we're trying to understand this in terms of what does it take to move beyond this, um, you know, we're trying to be very thoughtful about how do you think about creating scaled change? And again, this is, again, this is a core problem in our industry right now. Um, and so we, we actually think, you know, there's a, there's a systematic approach that's expensive to do, but when you do it, it's actually yields a very good in, insights. Um, what's the meaningful outcome that we're trying to create? Um, what is, what, what is going to matter here? Um, what data, what's the minimum data set that would be necessary to inflect performance? Um, how's that data, when it's analyzed, how is it going to drive different action? And who's going to take the action? And how do we get them the data and the insight at the right time so that they can actually take that action that will create this outcome? And what, is the other, what are the other supporting cast of characters that have to come together in the healthcare system in order to actually yield create that change that we're trying to create as well. And then, like, how will we know if we've gotten there? What is the desired outcome? And then how will we measure it at the end? How will we know if we've actually driven change as part of this process? And I think, to me, this is the, it's the system, it's making systematic the process of driving data not based on, or driving insight not based on technology and what data is available, but based on the problem set that's trying to be solved. Um, and, you know, I'll show you how we're thinking about it um, uh, here just very briefly because we're trying to make this much more, you know, kind of systematic for ourselves. Um, and people probably can't see this. I apologize for the size of the type. Um, but the first thing is try to figure out what's working. What is, the ins what is the insight that's out there of organizations that are doing something that makes something happen? So what are the thorniest challenges? How do you think about top performers? How do you think about what they do differently? How do you think about, um, you know, kind of the flaws and how other people do things? Um, how do you apply the insights? What kind of a and what kind of a solution could actually enable somebody to make change? And then make sure that's kind of the leftmost column. The middle column is then, you know, going through a little bit what I said before is what kind of data do you need In, inside the health system coming from outside the health system? Um, what kind of, how do you enrich the data in such a way that it's useful for somebody who's got to make, you know, high volume decisions on an ongoing basis? Um, and then how do you then get it to somebody? How do you get it to somebody in a workflow? And I think our industry has thought about analytic applications as not really workflow. You know, it's obviously when somebody's ordering, uh, when a physician is ordering something, there is a workflow associated with that. It has to go to the pharmacy, it has to be validated, you know, et cetera. But the, the problem, the, what we have to do in this new generation of healthcare is to think about the, the analytics in, in terms of workflow. Who's going to take it? Who's going to do something with it? How will we measure the outcome? And what is the, what is the next step in the process in order to improve that virtuous cycle? Um, so again, uh, if anybody has any ideas on how to uh, do this better, I couldn't be any more open to the, uh, to the suggestions. Um, I do hope everybody in here feels like you're working on a worthy problem. Um, it is massive how dysfunctional the system is out there. Um, and this is not just words, it is a dysfunctional system. And, but we're on the verge of actually being able, now that we do have the data available, 
with the creativity necessary and the ability to generate innovation, we're on the verge of actually being able to do something about it, I totally believe. Um, and by the way, if you are interested in some of these problems um, uh, and you're having trouble getting research funding, um, we do have spots open in our new product development team. <laughs> Um, but more importantly, um, there is a uh, opportunity, I think, for collaboration. Um, we generate a massive amount of data that is at a very, very detailed level that comes from the provider, uh, from the provider universe. Um, we're running through the detailed, we have detailed information on 40% of the in, uh, admissions that happen in the United States um, at the most detailed level that the organization captures that information. And um, so there's a tremendous opportunity. We've de-identified about half of it, um, but there's a tremendous opportunity. Um, and I don't know exactly how we could do it, but I'm, I would be open for conversation because we are not thinking, we are not, I am not, my team, my organization is not spending enough research time on what do you learn if you look at the data. Um, and there's a, there's a, there is a, um, you know, an amount of insight in there that I'm totally convinced of. So. You know, back to my uh, insights on uh, doing my PhD, a worthy problem, a great question, and then available data that hasn't really been scrubbed by a thousand other PhD students before you, um, you know, I think is, what's, is, is where we are from an opportunity perspective. Um, so uh, thank you all very much. Um, I uh, have kind of uh, uh, collapsed a lifetime into uh, 30 minutes here, and um, really we'll look forward to Q&A from um, anyone that wants to lob questions at me. So thank you again very much. Thank you very much. So if you'd like to ask a question, please step to the mic and uh, please also mention your uh, name and affiliation when you ask your question. Hi, my name is uh, Don Gil Ko. I'm from University of Cincinnati. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your talk and sharing with us your lifetime <laughs> experience. Um, I do have one quick question. Um, I've been working closely with Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Yep. And what I have learned uh, in terms of one of your comments you made with uh, respect to the cost-effective means to drive this interconnectivity, yep. um, the, a lot of the physicians and administrators, they see the value of IT uh, because it's all implemented. I think one of the challenges because of the administrative roadblocks or processes or politics perhaps that might be preventing from this interconnectivity to occur. So just want to get your insight with respect to your experience or any suggestions you might have uh, with respect to how that might actually be over, you know, actually be accomplished because I don't think it's the technology itself because they see the value of that. Yeah. But it's more at the policy level or politics or administrative level. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, so I think what we see is that if you get an empowered physician leader or set of physician leaders who are really, really engaged in a problem and really want to try to um, solve it, that's actually the best way to usually to get a, a kind of an administ a recalcitrant administration to kind of move in terms of how to do something. The other best way is if you've got a CFO who's actually kind of been made aware of an opportunity for you know, affecting some sort of the economics of the organization. So it's that, it's that clinical leadership team and it's the, the, the CFO or the, you know, kind of um, w who are usually in the forefront of driving to try to, you know, create new solutions that, you know, kind of mesh, merge data in a way that hasn't been done before. And Cincinnati Children's is a great example of an organization that has worked as hard as any organization in the country in terms of trying to drive patient safety outcomes and trying to drive, uh, you know, how do we make this a better place? And, um, you know, I believe there's still, you know, we're just at the, we're just scratching the surface in terms of I, things that we can identify through the data, both clinical data, but also, you know, across the continuum of care. So thanks for the question. Hi, yes. uh, so thanks for the great presentation. So my name is Ganesh Kuru from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. So speaking of lifetimes, in an earlier research life, I used to look at some of the software engineering problems. And software engineering communities, starting from the early 2000s, actually, put a lot of thought on how to put out products in a very quick manner. So mm -hmm. they started to experiment with agile methods. Mm -hmm. And so that's now there are several different variations of agile methods out there. Yes. So when you mentioned these, these like analytical workflows for, to solve some unknown problems, do you think some of those experiences can be brought into this domain? Yeah, so it's a great point. So um, 
the difference between generating, you know, kind of true workflow software and generating software that generates insights is that there is a ton of iteration that needs to happen. You create a model, you validate the model, you try it again, you, you know, you, there's just this iteration that's constantly going on. And it's ideally suited to uh, kind of agile methods of, um, you know, just getting, some, getting something out there. It may not be perfect, but, you know, trying, 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 learning by doing. Um, and it's certainly what we do 100% is to try to generate the shortest possible cycles in terms of the software engineering side of things so that we can just get, get stuff in front of people so that they can identify it. And, um, and it works according to your opinion? Sorry? It worked in your case? Um, yeah, well, um, <laughs> not as well as I'd like, but it works pretty darn well okay. compared, to, <laughs> compared to the other alternatives. Um, because speed is the essence of everything in, our, in, in my world. The ability to find data, bring it together, create, you know, create insights that are meaningful and get it out to a user community is, the, you know, is absolutely what we have to do. Um, and um, you know, the lar we're actually we're decent size. We're a $250 million technology company. But compared to the size of the big EMRs, you know, the major EMR vendors who are quickly becoming you know, kind of a duopoly, um, you know, we're a tenth of the size. So we, you know, it's speed of, and, and fleet of foot that is what you know, enables us to create value, create value in the industry. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Idrissa Jared. I'm from the University of Notre Dame. Um, I enjoyed your talk as well, and uh, I'll say that I'm very open to taking any data you want to give me. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, <laughs> I, uh, I specifically liked your idea about this post-EHR world, uh, and I had a question related to that in the sense that one of the concerns that I kind of see is that we have some kind of definitional creep or scope creep right. regards to EHR. There's all these new technologies and we're kind of rolling them into this idea of EHR and it kind of potentially it creates this uh, expectation around value which is maybe kind of not achievable, right? In the sense that mm -hmm. EHR is still kind of this silver bullet for healthcare. Yep. And we're not thinking about it as kind of a platform upon which to build new innovations. We're yep. thinking about it as the platform and all the solutions are part of that. And I was kind of wondering how, what you thought about kind of yeah, I think it's uh, the essential point that is confusing people, you know, kind of in the industry today because the HR providers actually, like, we can do that, we can do that, we can do that. It's, you know, and they can do a lot of it. And I'm not trying to, they're very fine companies. I worked at a great company, you know, in that space. But the core skill sets necessary to generate an understanding of information, changes in incentives, uh, the politics of organizations, you know, all those things. Is, it's a different type of skill set than the traditional hardcore software engineering. Um, so I, we, I think about it as there is a, you know, there is scope creep on what the EHR is defined as, and we should stop, the, we should try to stop that scope creep and kind of create the box that says, here's what an EHR transaction system is. Beyond that, there are analytic and transformational systems that need to be open and available regardless of what EHR system, you know, is processing the base transactions. So that, again, this, this kind of this approach to innovation and um, uh, breaking up local, really local monopolies on, you know, giant organizations in terms of the IT infrastructure, break that. And um, I don't know exactly how to do that to kind of create the category of, you know, the post-EHR analytic stuff, um, but it's certainly something that yeah, I, I hope people are starting to see because it's a, it is a real, it's a very um, dangerous spot to be in to say there are two or maybe three, four companies that are going to generate all the insights necessary to support a, you know, 16% of the, of the economy. Um, I mean, it's just ludicrous when you, when you think about it. it. And luckily, the policy community has really latched onto this. And the, I, you know, we're totally supportive of the work that is being done on the, in this regard, as well as in these industry initiatives that are coming up that offer a potential, they're just not going fast enough. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zainal Karaja. I'm an economist with Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Before I proceed to my question, I want to say thank you to Ritu and Gordon on behalf of my colleague for putting this great organization and seminar. So the question I have for you is, I see a lot of great words like the systems, the organizations. So as you know, like in recent years, there are big changes on the provider side, like hospitals consultations, yeah. hospitals become part of a centralized systems, and then we have on the other side, 
that is like uh, hospital physician integrations used to be horizontal, now it's moving towards the vertical integration. Yeah. So the question I have for you, like based on your experience or in your institutions, how do you think these market forces, the changes in these market forces will have impact, um, will impact the effectiveness, efficiency, and meaningful use of AHR? I don't know if it's on a broader perspective and yeah. from the provider perspective, if possible. Yeah, so um, great Thank question. Um, and it's really, a, I mean, the question of what, is the consolidate, what does the consolidation of the healthcare industry in the US, what does that really mean in terms of the ability? Is this better or worse? I think it's a pretty live, live topic at this stage. I do think that at, uh, there is tremendous investment that's necessary. And so the aggregation of organizations into larger entities that actually have more ability to invest in some of the, these advanced technologies, I think actually helps push us forward. Um, what I think it, what, and the, the ability then to actually hire new types of people, you know, et cetera, is also something that's uh, facilitated by the greater size of the organizations. Um, and you're, we're already starting to see changes in terms of the leadership structure of organizations. Chief medical officers aren't quite what they used to be. Chief transformation officer is a new and upcoming title, as an example. So you do see change in, in these organizational structures. Um, um, but I think that uh, without real and sustained payment reform that forces these organizations to then use that scale in a different way, we're not going to see you know, very, very fast progress. And I think all of the stuff that CMS is doing at this stage is actually you know, reducing fee-for-service rates, basically trying to drive people out of fee-for-service because you cannot make money on it, and driving them more into a value-based uh, world, I think is, you know, kind of at the essence of what's necessary. Trying to bring the blues insurers and the other insurers along so that they're, uh, the provider's not being asked to manage two separate business systems, one based on value and one based on volume. They're fundamentally different. So the more that can be done to try to create common approach of all the payers towards the provider system, I think, will really simplify the move of a fundamental business model transformation that these organizations need to do. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. There was one question back there of somebody when you, when, uh, uh, so I know I don't have time, but. All right. Uh, Raymond Dewey from the National Library of Medicine. Um, there's a lot of business opportunities in the BRIC countries. And uh, for example, in Southeast Asia, where it's not even EH, I mean, EHRs are at its infancy. It's pre-EHR. Yep. Do you have any tips, suggestions in driving uh, investment and creating value in these markets for driving health IT in those markets? Wow, that's a great, that is a great question. Um, uh, I'm going to punt it by saying that uh, I haven't actually been involved much in the international markets for a, a decade now. And so I don't think I have any kind of distinctive expertise to offer other than what would be very old news at this stage. Thank you all very much. I really, it's, it's been fun.